Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this worship service. The title of today's message is Jesus, King of Truth. The key verse is verse 37. Let's read this verse together. <clears throat> Let's go. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You are right in saying, I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for uh, Jesus who taught us uh, the word of God, especially through uh, uh, the sec our studies on the second half of uh, John's Gospel, we learned uh, the most important uh, things of our Christian life. May you bless us that we may engrave them into our hearts, that we may never forget them. Instead, we may live by them so that what you planned for us may be done in our life. Our Father, we have gathered here to worship you, Lord. Our Father, please purify us that we, with a single-hearted uh, uh, dedication, we may worship you this time. May you bless this worship service from the beginning to the end. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. First, I am he. Look at verse 1. After his high priestly prayer, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley and came to the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem. There was an olive grove, and he and his disciples went into it. Probably this was the place called Gethsemane, which was located on the lower slopes of the Mount of, of Olives. There Jesus prayed, saying, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Jesus had a fierce prayer struggle, shedding a lot of sweat and even blood. And through this wholehearted prayer struggle, he won the victory. All hints of hesitation were removed from his heart, and he was determined to obey God's will and go through all the pains all the, the, for God's purpose. He won the great victory. Then he said to the disciples, Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the grove, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the, from the chief priests and Pharisees. They were carrying torches and lanterns and weapons. Here, a detachment of soldiers is a band of Roman soldiers hired of, uh, by the religious leaders. Mark's Gospel, chapter 14, in King James Version, describes the situation saying, a great multitude with the swords and staffs. So, here a detachment of soldiers did not mean 20 or 30 soldiers. A great multitude but several hundred soldiers, showing that the religious leaders were really determined to arrest Jesus and kill him. They did not want to make any mistake in this matter. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, I am he, Jesus said. At this they all drew back and fell to the ground. When Jesus said, I am he, they were so shocked and scared that about 500 soldiers all drew back and fell to the ground. Wow, Jesus was really powerful. When you think about this, we can see that all these soldiers were actually fearful when they were ordered to go and arrest Jesus. They had to obey that order. But when they, they knew that Jesus was a great man of God, 
They knew all the miracles Jesus had performed. The power of God was working in and through Jesus. And now they were going to arrest him to bring harmony. They were really scared. Then at Jesus' words, I am he. They were really frightened. Maybe they screamed, no! <laughs> and they fell back. Look at verses 7 and 8. Again, he asked them, who is it you want? Still on the ground with a shaky voice. They said, Jesus of Nazareth. <laughs> then Jesus said, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. Even in that situation, when he was going to be arrested, tortured, and killed, Jesus was concerned about his disciples. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, threw it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Marcus. Peter loved Jesus, and out of loyalty to him, he wanted to protect him. But because of that, the situation could have turned really bloody. But before the soldiers took any action, Jesus quickly intervened into the situation, saying to Peter, Put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Jesus here describes his obedience to God's will as drinking the cup the Father had, has given him. Loving God with a lip service is cheap. And God does not accept that kind of love. But loving God by obeying his command is difficult and often painful. It requires a lot of self-denial. It requires a lot of cross-taking. The cup God gave Jesus to drink was filled with pains and sorrows. He would suffer and be mistreated and humiliated. Jesus was determined to drink the cup of sorrows and pains by obeying God's will upon him. At that time, Jesus remained strong. This was the son's attitude toward the father. No matter what direction the father gave him, the son, by any means, would obey it, even if it was hard and costly. When the son's attitude toward the father was like this, how cute and lovely he, uh, he was in the eyes of the father. I wish I had that kind of son. On the contrary, Peter's way of loving Jesus was to use the sword and fight for him physically. At first, Peter looked bold and loyal to Jesus, but he only caused more troubles and dangers. Instead of peace and joy, he brought more concern and anxiety to Jesus. That's not God's way. That's not what Jesus wanted Peter to do. In order to follow Jesus, now Peter had to learn the way of God. That was drinking the cup. Often, we feel like using the sword when we are humiliated, or some conflicting situation comes, or when people scratch our pride, we want to retaliate. Maybe verbally, we shout, and then we pour out our anger on them. In that way, you, you, we use the sword of anger. Or sometimes we are uh, uh, we feel uh, we are angry because of the sense of injustice. So we pull out the sword of justice. We shout, justice. But the problem is, when we pull out our sword, when we use our sword, the situation gets worse. Think about in the family, husband and wife. Someone uses the sword. 
angry. Wow. Then the other person is hurt, and that person also the the the, the attack. Wow. Then great war occurs, and this is a fly. And Or think about at uh, at work, everybody uses a sword. Uh, and think about in the church, people fight all the way. That is not God's way. Jesus says, "All who throw the sword will die by the sword." Maybe you win one time, maybe even two times, maybe even three times, but the first time you are killed. So don't use the sword. It is not God's way. We must remember that drinking the cup is God's way. Drinking the cup of sorrows, you swallow sorrows. Drinking the cup of the sense of humiliation, you swallow that sense of humiliation. Then, because of you, conflict stops with you. It was spreading all the way, but when it comes to you, it stops. That is God's way. In verses 12 through 27, the Apostle John shows the difference between Jesus and Simon Peter in dealing with challenges. Jesus was brought to Annas, the father-in-law of the high priest that year. He had been the high priest for many years. And now his, son, uh, his son-in-law succeeded him as the high priest. That's why Annas was still called the high priest in the passage. When Annas asked him about his disciples and his teaching, Jesus said, I have spoken openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. Jesus had nothing to hide because he was serving God's work. At the time, he was free. He was free to teach others. So openly and publicly, he taught people the word of God. At Jesus' answer, Annas was shocked and puzzled. Jesus was too powerful for him to deal with. So he sent him to Caiaphas, the high priest. But when Peter was challenged about his love for Jesus... He failed miserably, disowning Jesus three times even before a slave girl. The top disciple, Simon Peter, disowning Jesus three times before this slave girl for the fear of death was really humiliating. Maybe at this, the enemies were giggling and laughing. Indeed, Satan was sifting Simon Peter like wheat, as if Simon was his toy. A few hours ago, Simon said, I will lay down my life for you. Was he lying? No. He really meant what he said. Then how come he failed so miserably like this? It was because he was confident of his love for Jesus, and thereby he did not pray. He was self-confident without knowing the true reality, how the spiritual world would go, and how strong the enemy was, and how weak he was. When the enemy set him up, when a real challenge came up, he would be found as a miserable failure if he did not pray. He did not know that. Without knowing this spiritual world, he was just confident. I love Jesus. Peter did what he had never wanted to do. When a rooster crowed, Peter remembered what Jesus had told him about. Then his heart was pierced. He went out and wept bitterly. He broke down. After this event, he would never be a man of self-confidence. Peter's failure shows that 
we must not be men or women of self-confidence in loving Jesus, in living as Jesus' disciples, or just the offering cheap lip service saying, I love Jesus. I'll be a martyr for Jesus. The kind of things do not work in the spiritual world. Instead, we must be men and women of prayer, understanding how weak we are, and understanding how strong the enemy is. Then we prepare ourselves through prayer all the more, so that when the challenging situation rises, we can stand firm in Jesus Christ. 